Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Mexico Institute's 10th Annual U.S.-Mexico Security Conference. My name is Andrew Rudman. I'm the director of the Mexico Institute, and it's really my pleasure to welcome you all this afternoon. During panel sessions this afternoon, and again on February 1st, we'll discuss the myriad security challenges facing our two countries. As this audience well knows, many of these challenges relate directly to the flow of drugs northbound from or through Mexico and the flow of guns and money south. This linkage makes bilateral cross-border collaboration essential. We will hear a number of speakers share their thoughts on steps each government can or should take to improve the security of citizens and residents in both countries and to address societal ills such as drug abuse and addiction. Over the course of our conference, we'll focus on some of the challenges that are facing uh, our uh, two countries, um, including those uh, which uh, the AMO administration faces as it seeks to implement its security strategy. The challenges facing Mexico, including combating transnational organized crime, reducing violent crime, including femicide, and meaningful prosecution of criminals for those crimes, are longstanding challenges and will require concerted efforts that will likely extend beyond any single presidential administration in either country. We thought it was appropriate to kick off our conference with, by hearing first from representatives of our two governments. It's no secret that security cooperation between our countries has always been challenging, sometimes impeded by concerns about US intervention in Mexican domestic affairs, and at other times by very different conceptions of the causes and appropriate responses. Over time, however, a level of trust and shared objectives was established, which led to greater cooperation, including cross-border operations. This cooperation was set back by the arrest of Mexican General Cienfuegos in the United States and the subsequent passage of Mexican legislation constraining the ability of US law enforcement to operate in Mexico. Fortunately, the Biden and AMLO administrations were committed to restoring that trust and cooperation while maintaining respect for national sovereignty. These efforts culminated with the high-level security dialogue in early October of last year and the creation of the Mexico-US Bicentennial Framework for Security, Public Health, and Safe Communities, which replaces the often misunderstood Merida Initiative. Now, just a few months into this new era, we're fortunate to be joined this afternoon by Ambassador Todd Robinson and Counselor Gina Borquette, who will provide an update on bilateral collaboration and share their government's plans to address drug and arms trafficking and related security challenges. Following opening remarks from both officials, I will be happy to moderate a question and answer session, and that will include an opportunity for those of you watching to pose questions either by tagging us on Twitter, at Mexico Institute, or by emailing Mexico at wilsoncenter.org. I'm pleased to first introduce Ambassador Todd Robinson, who was sworn in as the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs on September 30, 2021. Ambassador Robinson last served as Director of the International Student Management Office at the National Defense University. Prior to his assignment at NDU, he served as Senior Advisor for Central America in the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. Ambassador Robinson is a career diplomat with overseas postings, including in the Dominican Republic, Bolivia, Vatican City, Italy, El Salvador, Guatemala, Venezuela, and Colombia. A native of New Jersey, Ambassador Robinson was a professional journalist before joining the Foreign Service. He's a graduate of the Georgetown University Edmund Walsh School of Foreign Service. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to the Mexico Institute for hosting this event and for inviting me to speak on our security cooperation with, uh, with Mexico. I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Georgina for joining us uh, today. It was uh, Woodrow Wilson who said, I not only use all the brains that I have, but all that I can borrow. Um, I think, th I believe that that's to be the spirit uh, of the Wilson Center. You bring together a wide spectrum of people with different opinions and experiences to propose policies that can shape, shape 
a more prosperous future. I'm here to participate in this great event as much as I am here to learn from all of you. As the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs at the US Department of State, I value open dialogue, critical thinking, and new ideas to achieve our foreign policy and national security objectives. One of our goals at INL is to become more of a learning organization, one that can leverage the great insights and analysis of individual individuals and institutions that follow these issues closely. So thank you for having me and thank you to all, uh, to all of you for engaging in this broader discourse to enhance the bilateral relationship between the United States uh, and Mexico. The security challenges we face around the world are increasingly complex and solving them requires partnerships, both foreign and domestic, to ensure we leverage the best tools and expertise available. INL works with international groups, non-governmental organizations, other US federal agencies, and US state and local criminal justice professionals to develop policies and drug control standards, share best practices, and build capacity of our foreign partners to help reduce crime, increase, the, uh, increase stability, and accountability, as well as promote public safety. We engage the entire spectrum of the criminal justice system, including police, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, forensic ex experts, and co correctional uh, officers to support partner government's efforts to build effective, transparent, fair, and accountable justice systems. We're working in 90 countries um, but as you all well know, no relationship is quite like our enduring partnership with our neighbor to the South, Mexico. This year, we celebrate 200 years of bilateral relations between the United States and Mexico. Our countries have always shared more than a border. As neighbors, partners, and friends, our countries share deep cultural, economic, and yes, security ties. The security issues we face have direct and painful consequences for citizens of both countries. According to the CDC, more than 100,000 people in the United States died of drug overdoses between June 20th and June 21st. This represents a 28% increase over the previous 12 month period, and it is the highest total ever recorded. These are real people with real lives and real families. The potent synthetic drug fentanyl was responsible for 64% of those over, overdose deaths. Fentanyl overdoses have now been the leading cause of death for Americans aged 18 to 45 for two years running, even as the world struggles with the COVID-19 pandemic. Deaths from methamphetamine, cocaine, and prescription pain medication also climb, continue to climb in the United States and methamphetamine use is also a growing problem in Mexico. Even when they are not lethal, drugs wreak havoc on, in our communities and derail the health and well-being of our people. And the vast majority of these illicit drugs are produced in or trafficked through Mexico, often using precursor chemicals from the People Repu People's Republic of China by criminal organizations that deliver these deadly drugs to, the, to US communities and benefit from the illicit proceeds. At the same time, Mexico is experiencing a tragic homicide rate of more than 29 deaths for every 100,000 people, many of which involve firearms trafficked from the United States by these same criminal organizations. These criminal markets, these criminals market and sell their product on the dark web. They sabotage the integrity of our financial systems. They corrupt people sworn to protect our societies. They hold no respect for our laws and global tre treaties. They prey on migrants and other vulnerable populations. They undermine economic growth. They erode public trust and they challenge our hope for a safe and prosperous future. To respond to all of this, our two governments could have drawn up the bridges and um, closed ourselves off from each other. Instead, there is a solid spirit of hope and teamwork 
from our two governments to confront these challenges together. Instead, our two governments uh, chose to articulate a vision for how we could deepen our commitment and cooperation to tackle these complex problems. Over 14 years, the Medida Initiative had been a key element of our bilateral cooperation to address these security challenges, but the growth of synthetic, uh, synthetics, negative, negative trends on arms trafficking and homicides, and new approaches to public health created a need to modernize and broaden our cooperation. We knew a new framework would have to be developed together, two countries sitting down at the table, analyzing the problem in front of us and using our combined strengths and expertise to develop effective solutions. We recognized the need, we, we recognized we needed a more comprehensive approach to these issues, one that would extend beyond foreign assistance and operational law enforcement and traditional security partnerships to acknowledge and incorporate the linkages between public health, equitable justice, and public safety while respecting each other's sovereignty. And that is what we created. On October, on, on October 8th, I joined Secretary of State Blinken, Secretary of Homeland Security Mayorkas, Attorney General Garland, and uh, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury Adeyemo at the launch of our high-level security dialogue with Mexico. Our two countries established a common understanding of our shared threats and priorities and inaugurated the new bicentennial framework for security, uh, public health, and safe communities. It's a historic declaration of our alliance and our vision for a safer and more secure home for people on both sides of the border. The framework expands our partnership into new areas of cooperation, fosters a culture of learning to ensure we evaluate the impact of our efforts together and underscores the belief that we must trust one another and maintain a mutual responsibility to tackle these challenges side by side. The framework aligns with the United States interim national security strategic guidance and is informed by the Biden-Harris administration's drug policy, drug po policy priorities, which promote evidence-based treatment and prevention to reduce drug demand and overdoses and promote racial equity, community-based crime prevention and harm reduction efforts. Under the new framework, the United States and Mexico outlined three goals. First, protect our people. We will work to lower violence driven by organized crime and to address addiction as a public health concern. Second, prevent transborder crime. We will work to increase capacity to prevent the diversion of precursor chemicals for illicit drug production and strengthen border and port management Disrupt, my, disrupt migrant smuggling and human trafficking and reduce the trafficking of weapons. And finally, third, pursue criminal networks. We will work to dismantle the financial architecture of criminal organizations, enhance capacity to investigate and prosecute high impact crimes and increase cooperation on extraditions. Promoting the rule of law, human rights, information sharing and combating corruption are priorities that will continue to guide all aspects of our cooperation. I have a deep respect for what our countries did next. Our governments acknowledged the importance of developing measurable goals and indicators and committed to transparently and regularly evaluate the impact of our uh, efforts. We will hold ourselves accountable to leverage data to, re to shape our efforts, and we will look for ways to communicate publicly the results of our security cooperation. This is a significant commitment. Let me offer one ongoing and significant area of focus as an example of how these concepts intersect, the US-Mexico border. Transnational criminal organizations exploit our shared border as the main entry point for illegal drugs into the United States and weapons and bulk cash into Mexico. An awful lot of cooperation takes place along the border every day, yet there is more work to be done to boost efficiency at the border. 
The United States and Mexico have desperate and often redundant border management policies, procedures, technologies, and infrastructure. Addressing these challenges includes applying technology in more strategic, coordinated ways, but also streamlining processes and reducing government stovepiping. We can reimagine how our two countries collaboratively manage a, small, a smart border for the benefit of our security and economic competitiveness. The reality is that the nearly $2 billion in trade that crosses our border is critical to the livelihoods and prosperity of millions of our citizens. And we need to think of our border as a shared resource. With advances in imagery scanning and other best practices, there is ample uh, opportunity for both countries to share more information and resources and to jointly assess suspicious activity in ways that reduce wait times, improve security, combat corruption, and boost trade. The Bicentennial Framework for Security, Public Health, and safe communities sets a strong foundation for cooperation of which both countries can, can be tremendously proud. But the framework is only the beginning. The hard work is ahead of us. Together, we can devise actions that result in a stronger future for Mexico and the United States. And to my colleagues at the Wilson Center, thank you for this opportunity and for bringing us together on this very important topic. Thank you. Thanks, Ambassador Robinson. Really appreciate the remarks. And, and we always appreciate it when speakers quote Woodrow Wilson. So thank you for that as well. Um, I, I'd now like to turn to Counselor Gina Borquette, Head of Borders and Special Affairs at the Mexican Embassy in Washington. Counselor Borquette joined the Mexican Foreign Service in 2005 and has served as Deputy Consul in Tecunumán, Guatemala, and in Brownsville, Texas. In 2011, she was appointed as head of political affairs at the Embassy of Mexico in Canada. And in 2013, she became the special affairs director at the Mexican Foreign Ministry. She has held her current position here in Washington since 2019. Uh, Counselor Borquette has a bachelor's degree in international relations from the Autonomous Institute of Technology of Mexico, ETOM a master's degree in defense and hemispheric security from the Inter-American Defense College in Washington, and a master's degree in public policy and management from the University of Texas. She has published articles in Foreign Affairs Latino America and Hemisferio. And, and now I'd like to turn it over to you, Councillor Burkett. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I am delighted to join the Mexico Institute's 10th annual US-Mexico Security Conference. This forum has proven to be one of the most comprehensive and thorough reviews of the state of security matters in Mexico and the bilateral cooperation with the United States. I want to thank Mexico Institute's director, Andrew Rudman, for the invitation. I am also honored to be sharing the virtual stage with Ambassador Todd Robinson, Assistant Secretary for INL. I am certain that the conversations that will be held today and on February 1st will be very enriching. The government of Mexico's national strategy for public safety has a clear goal to attain sustainable peace. Through a multidimensional approach, it combats transnational criminal organizations through a comprehensive strategy that prioritizes financial intelligence over the use of force. While doing so, it focuses on eradicating the root causes of crime and violence by implementing policies that foster education and generate sustainable employment opportunities for vulnerable populations. These policies will develop resilient societies with a dignified human approach that will ultimately achieve widespread peace. One of the most significant changes that the administration has implemented is the creation of the National Guard which has over 100,000 members deployed across the country. Together, along with other law enforcement agencies, they have successfully strengthened their tactical coordination, resulting in successful seizures of illegal drugs, weapons, and bulk cash, 
as well as the dismantling of clandestine laboratories and the disruption of financial networks and arrests. These efforts have derived in the following seizures, 2,429 pounds of opium gum and 3,082 pounds of heroin, 274,993 pounds of methamphetamines, 143,344 pounds of cocaine, and 6,803 pounds of fentanyl. It is worth highlighting that these fentanyl seizures represent an increase of more than 450% compared to the last three years of the previous administration. Through financial intelligence, 46,000 accounts linked to criminal organizations were blocked, retrieving almost 14 billion pesos from criminal activity. It is essential to underscore that the government has focused primarily on combating arms trafficking and has seized 36,956 firearms and 10.7 million cartridges in this past years. Furthermore, since 2019, 2,500 individuals linked to organized criminal organizations have been arrested, of which 878 of them could generate violence in localized areas. Undoubtedly, these continued efforts to arrest and seize illegal substances have hindered the capacity of transnational criminal organizations. As a result of this administration efforts to win peace, the spike in crime incidents has been reverted. The murder rate has shown a downward trend for six consecutive months, deriving in a decrease of 3.5%. In addition, between January and November 2021, the number of kidnapping victims decreased 50.4%, compared to 2019. Regarding drug cultivation, it is important to highlight that the latest estimates published by the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy indicate that puppy cultivation and potential heroin production in Mexico also decreased for the third consecutive year in 2020, reaching its lowest since 2014. Puppy cultivation in Mexico decreased by 24% from 30,400 hectares in 2019 to 23,200 hectares in 2020. In addition, opium puppy cultivation throughout Mexico fell 47% since a record high in 2017. Similarly, potential pure production decreased by 24% from 78 metric tons in 2019 to 59 in 2020. The strengthening of customs capabilities has complemented these achievements. In 2020, the Lopez Obrador administration launched a strategy to combat corruption and strengthen intelligence sharing to proactively identify the trafficking of drugs, weapons, chemical precursors, and other illicit goods sent to Mexico. Transnational organized crime is multidimensional and continuously evolves in developing new routes to traffic arms, drugs, cash, illicit goods, and trafficking in persons. Mexico reevaluated its international cooperation regarding security and reinforced the importance of combating arms trafficking. The reason is that the acquisition of high caliber weapons allows criminal organizations to build their capacity and power. Henceforth, in recent years, the government of Mexico has highlighted the importance of combating arms trafficking from different angles and with a multi-layered approach and has insisted on the importance of this topic in bilateral and multilateral forums and meetings. In the spirit of renovating mutual trust and respect and under equal circumstances, Mexico and the United States acknowledged the need to renew the bilateral security cooperation. In October 2021, the Bicentennial Framework for Security, Public Health and Safe Communities was adopted by Mexico and the United States to protect our people, prevent cross-border crime and pursue criminal networks. Both countries agreed on focusing on preventing substance abuse disorders, implementing harm reduction policies and expanding access to treatment. Moreover, 
they both will work on reinforcing the use of intelligence to dismantle the financial operations of criminal organizations that commit crimes in both countries. The most innovative aspect was that this collaboration also included cyberspace by recognizing that criminal interactions are increasingly occurring on the web. Under this framework, collaborative work between both governments to strengthen capacities to combat organized crime has become a priority. A fundamental part of this new strategy is to improve coordination and expedite information sharing to detect financial crimes and reduce criminal organizations' capacities by seizing at ports of entry, weapons, money, and precursors used to synthesize illegal psychoactive substances. Furthermore, under the bicentennial framework, both governments will work together to expand non-intrusive detection equipment and share intelligence to increase seizures of illegal substances at land, air, and seaports of entry. In addition, both countries will enhance efficient information sharing develop bilateral assessments to detect new routes and chemical precursors and trafficking of firearms. At the regional level, since 2016, Mexico, the United States and Canada have been working under the North American Drug Dialogue, also known as NAD. In this framework, they share information and best practices to reduce opioid use and availability. There have been trilateral information exchanges and joint training on land and maritime ports of entry to detect the trafficking of fentanyl. Furthermore, the three countries have worked on trilateral assessments of multimodal trafficking and consumption trends for heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, and fentanyl as a region. Likewise, information is exchanged concerning preventive programs and treatments to address addictions. Moreover, monthly exchanges are also carried out regarding forensic analysis of substances to detect the possible emergence of new drugs or risk patterns. Regularly, best practices are shared to improve prevention and treatment for those dealing with substance abuse. This mechanism sets an example of how cooperation needs to adapt and adjust to the ever-changing nature of crime and the drug phenomenon. The fifth annual meeting hosted by Mexico will occur in the coming weeks. During this meeting, each country will share its efforts to address illicit finance and how they have been combating the trafficking and use of illegal substances in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the primary outcomes of this meeting will be the roadmap to combat transnational organized crime from a regional perspective. The fight against human trafficking has also been a priority for both governments. Existing mechanisms include training for consular officials to detect trafficking cases and collaboration with federal and state agencies for victim assistance. Likewise, cooperation has been expanded to detect and dismantle human traffickers networks through financial intelligence in law enforcement matters. Furthermore, it is key to acknowledge that cyberspace is the new arena where most illicit transactions occur. Drugs may be obtained in cyberspace with increasing ease. Payments are often made with cryptocurrencies, which are more difficult to track, and the drugs are delivered by mail, eliminating street dealers. These internet sales also make tracking more complex and expand distribution networks, many of which come from Asia through international parcels. This new model can increase the demand, given that drug buying risks decreases if they are done online. Cyberspace specifically offers a great area of opportunity to establish bilateral collaboration to grant the security of our citizens. From protecting critical infrastructure, tracking illicit cryptocurrency transactions, detecting and dismantling trafficking in persons and illicit goods, the digital environment poses increasing challenges for our governments and the region. Developing clear international regulations that define the concept of sovereignty in cyberspace is essential to consolidate a cyber defense and cyber security policy. Therefore, we must proactively address it and establish norms and regulations 
to provide a framework for law enforcement operation and prosecution of cases. This year, we shall see the full implementation of the Bicentennial Framework Working Groups to develop short and medium-term action plans. Based on renewed trust, this reinvigorated collaboration will allow both countries to continue strengthening the bilateral cooperation to enhance information sharing to disrupt the traditional and non-traditional routes used to traffic arms, drugs, and bulk cash along the border. If we learned one thing from the COVID-19 pandemic is that criminal organizations change and adapt at a swift pace. For this reason, Mexico and the United States must remain at the forefront of the dynamic and evolving nature of transnational criminal organizations that continue to develop new technologies and tactics. Our governments need to be proactive and share information and best practices in real time to dismantle their operations efficiently. Finally, it is important to underscore that under the Bicentennial Framework, we have institutionalized our cooperation even further, proving that our countries seek to enter a new era of collaboration that responds to the current global environment by being dynamic and proactive. To grant durable peace, we will deepen our partnership, trust, and mutual respect and adapt it to the current multidimensional challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. That was that was great. Thank you both for, for those overviews. Uh, I, I think clearly a lot of overlap in, in what you said, which, which is obviously important given that we're talking about a bilateral initiative. Uh, we're gonna move to questions and answers for a little bit of time. Uh, and I think we've gotten a couple, but just a reminder, you can submit them by tagging us on Twitter at Mexico Institute, or you can email them to Mexico at wilsoncenter.org. Um, I'm gonna start if I could of a, a couple questions that, that I think you could both uh, answer. Uh, the first, uh, you both uh, mentioned monitoring and evaluation uh, as part of the framework to show the results. I'm, I'm wondering if the governments have yet agreed on, on some common definitions and common metrics of success so that um, others observing their, your progress can actually see what, what's happening. So maybe I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Ambassador Robinson. Uh, I think the short answer is no. I think we're still working on it. Um, uh, you know, we we uh, it was important for us to recognize that uh, that this was something that the the public wanted and needed. Um, but as you know, the devils are the devils often in the details, and how you define uh, uh, success uh, is going to be a collaborative has to be a collaborative effort. On uh, on both sides, um, I, I think it's important that we both both governments have recognized that this is necessary. But I think it's going to take some time to uh, to sit down and talk about you know definitions and indicators and making sure that um, that it's not just a, a check the box exercise, but it's something that's meaningful for our governments and our and our people. Thank you. Uh, did you want to add anything to that, Gina? The importance of this negotiation was that when we were sitting down, we had in mind that we had to develop metrics and that we had to develop definitions. So once we get all our action plans uh, defined, then we can develop from there this, as Ambassador said, this metrics to be able to know where we're, what we're doing right and what needs to be changed. Great. Thank you. Um, an another topic that you both mentioned um, briefly uh, is, is, of course, fentanyl and uh, the, the death of, of about 100,000 uh, people in the United States in the last year and, and the flow of precursors from China. So I wonder if, if you could share any more information on the cooperation between the two governments with respect to, to the flows of precursors and illicit drugs from China and, and from uh, other places outside the region. And, and maybe I'll start with you, um, Gina, this time. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, we are working at different levels. The most important is the sharing of information and intelligence to be able to detect the new precursors to then harmonize our controlled substances between both countries and also include Canada. So it's this constant sharing of information and intelligence and tracing that allows us as governments to be proactive. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Ambassador. Yeah, no, I, I, I think she's exactly right. Georgina is exactly right. I, the only thing I would add is um, one of the things that the new framework um, touches on that perhaps had not been touched on before is the responsibility of the United States to sort of look inward a little bit and figure out, you know, what is it about our society that, um, that uh, makes these uh, synthetic drugs so attractive? Um, and this is something that has come up in uh, my uh, Senate and, and congressional testimony. Um, and it's not, you know, obviously it's not an easy question uh, to, to answer, but it is important that we now uh, have put it down on paper that, uh, that we're willing, we, the United States, are willing to look at this issue too. And we are committing ourselves to doing this um, importantly enough to, to the government of Mexico, with the government of Mexico, but also uh, with our own people. Thanks, I, I mean, that, that's clearly important. You know, what, what you're raising is sort of that classic supply and demand question of, of the, the, um, the criminals are providing it because somebody wants to buy it. And it, it, it does make one wonder as, as the governments look at flows of drugs, whether some of the reductions for example, in, in poppy uh, production, is that eradication or is that because the market has essentially shifted and, and those who, who used to consume heroin are now looking for synthetic? Uh, not something I think either one of you knows the answer to, but, but, but something that comes to mind as, as you're speaking. Um, we have a couple questions now that have come in from our audience and I'll just repeat one last time. You can tweet at Mexico Institute or email mexico at wilsoncenter.org. Um, one question we received is asking the speakers if they could talk to what the US and Mexican governments are doing to prevent organized crime from profiting from the increasing numbers of migrants who are being held at the border as a result of the migrant protection protocols or the Remain in Mexico program. So maybe I'll start with you, Ambassador. Yeah, no, it's a great question. We are we continue to work uh, uh, very closely. Um, obviously, uh, we were we were grateful for uh, grateful to the government of Mexico for continuing the the MPP. Um, we are we are collaborating on investigations. We are trying to um, to help Mexico uh, deal with the with the uh, growing the ever-growing humanitarian situation, uh, not something that either one of our, uh, neither one of our governments were, were wholly uh, prepared uh, to, to address. But we're also doing um, more, I know, you know, I, I would uh, defer to uh, the FBI and Department of Homeland Security, but we're also um, trying to work more closely with the uh, Mexican uh, uh, prosecutors to go after these networks um, criminally, but perhaps more importantly, to try to trace their money and go after their money. I think that's where, when you when you uh, combine those two efforts, you can really uh, make a difference. And um, uh, I think we are getting better at doing that. Great. I'll go to you, Gina. If you want to add anything to that. Yes, I, I wanted to underscore the importance of financial intelligence in these cases to actually follow the money and see what the roots are and how they're making the payments actually helps us prosecute cases from its core. And that's one of the big changes that we have made and that have been proved to be efficient also for trafficking in persons. So it's through financial intelligence that we can really get an idea of how the market is evolving and how we can dismantle it. Thank you. Yes, you, you both. Uh, it, it sounds like if I can oversimplify a strategy, it, it's very much a follow the money strategy. 
um, as opposed to perhaps uh, prior efforts, which were focusing more on on people. If, if again, if I can sort of oversimplify, uh, sort of a, uh, the the classic kingpin strategy. Um, another question that we have that's that's come in um, from our friend Jose Diaz Briseño with Reforma is is asking you, uh, Assistant Secretary Robinson, if you would. Uh, speak about the killing of Mexican journalists. Uh, there have been several high profile murders of late and the impunity that seems to surround those attacks on journalists. Sure, look, uh, uh, the United States government um, has been at the forefront uh, at speaking uh, for the protections uh, and the importance of protecting uh, journalists around the world. Uh, whether here in the United States or in in other countries, um, obviously, you know, we would we would uh, we would um, be open to uh, helping anywhere we need to. We're we're invited to to help to to track down um, uh, uh, the 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 um, people who perpetrated. Uh, this crime, but it is it is really incumbent upon um, uh, Western democracies uh, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to to protect uh, to protect our journalists and la and allow them to do the important work that they that they do. Great, thank you. Um, let me I'll, I'll shift gears a little bit. Um, Recently, the Arms Control Association named Mexico and Foreign Minister Ebrard as the Person of the Year for 2021 in recognition of Mexico's decision to sue U.S. gun manufacturers in U.S. courts. So, Gina, I wondered if you could share a little bit of the background behind that suit um, and, and an update on where things stand, again, recognizing it's an ongoing case. So I'm, I'm not sure how much detail you can provide on the, the situation at the moment. Certainly, uh, once the definition of the importance of combating arms trafficking was defined, uh, the government, as I mentioned in the speech, developed a multi-layer approach, one of which was suing these uh, companies for negligent practices. As you mentioned, it is an ongoing process, so I won't go into further detail, but this is one of the aspects of how the government is combating arms trafficking and the first step that was done was acknowledging the importance and defending it and actually putting that topic in multilateral and bilateral forums. Great, thank you. Uh, see, we have uh, another, an, another I'm sorry, question. Andrew? Oh, sure, please go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I would just, uh, I would just add, obviously um, my Department of Justice colleagues are, are a better place to speak to this. Um, but uh, it's going to take a strong collaborative effort on the part of both uh, the United States and Mexico to, to get at this. Um, and I think one of the highlights of the uh, bicentennial framework is that we have committed to, to doing um, that kind of collaborative work um, uh, uh, to go after uh, the illegal arms networks. Um, that have been, at, you know, at work for years, but but now we're uh, we in uh, Mexico are making a commitment to go after the, after them, and and I think that that's uh, that's an important uh, achievement, uh, which differentiates uh, the bicentennial bicentennial framework from, say, uh, Merida. Yes, that, that that's a great point, and I, I think certainly a, a shift in a shift or an addition uh, could we say to the to the traditional focus uh, between the U.S. and Mexico, um, which I think again an, another way to to reinforce the points you both made about how this is really an effort to 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 collaborate and address all aspects of the problem, in, including you both you both spoke at some length about demand reduction, and uh, and that's obviously critical as well. Um, we have another question. Um, uh, it was an interesting question on, on cryptocurrency uh, for, for both of you. I'll let you decide who wants to go first, um, asking uh, for a bit more detail if possible about new rules for sovereignty of cryptocurrency and how this might be done 
and whether it would be done in concert with international organizations. I don't know. <laughs> Ambassador Robinson, if you have any any thoughts on that, it's a complicated question, I, I realize. Yes, and, and I will be the first to recognize that I am not uh, anywhere near an expert on uh, cryptocurrency. I, I would uh, totally defer to my, my colleagues at the Department of Treasury. But I, I will say, um, uh, to the extent uh, criminal organizations, transnational organized uh, criminal organizations are uh, using uh, cryptocurrency uh, to uh, continue their illegal activity or benefit from their illegal activity. I don't think anything is taken off the table. Um, I think uh, we are, um, at least the United States government, I won't speak for the, the Mexican government, but the United States government is willing to work with other governments uh, and or international organizations to make sure that we're using all of the tools in our available to us to, uh, to, to make sure that we can monitor uh, and trace uh, ill-gotten gains uh, by these uh, criminal organizations. Great. Thank you. Uh, Gina, did you want to add anything on, on cryptocurrency or, or international coordination? Yes, I, I wanted to add that this is, as well as it's ongoing, it's very new, and we're actually trying to identify and trace these different activities with cryptocurrency and how they develop to be able to act collaboratively, as Ambassador said, with other governments. And it is still a certain gray area, but we need to work and develop rules and regulations internationally, nationally, and binationally to be able to trace them and dismantle it. It's, it's something that's ongoing and it's one of the, our main priorities because it's, it's, as I mentioned, it's in the cyberspace that the new activities, new illicit activities are taking place and we have to be very aware of it. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have just a few minutes left of this panel, so if, if you have questions for our, our excellent speakers, please uh, send them in. In the meantime, um, Gina, you, you talked some about, about reductions, uh, in, important reductions in Mexico in, in rates of, of different crimes, uh, which is obviously incredibly important, although the numbers in Mexico for, for murders, for femicides, for uh, kidnappings remain high. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the Lopez Obrador government strategy for, for trying to reduce levels of violence. Um, the main focus is uh, using financial intelligence and also the creation of the National Guard with 100,000 elements that have already been deployed has actually helped reduce this uh, different crimes. We know, as I mentioned, that we are starting to see some trends to be reverted, uh, but the cases are still high, we acknowledge it, but we can start to see at midterms uh, through the mid-administration that we're, the government uh, strategy is beginning to revert those tendencies. And also strong work has been done to make resilient communities and create further education opportunities and job opportunities in those 50 uh, localities that are suffering from most violence. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me just look to see if we have other questions coming in. We are um, coming up uh, on time and uh, maybe if, if I could, um, Let's go back uh, just to, to both of you again. Um, as I mentioned, and, and you both mentioned, we, we did talk uh, about demand reduction and efforts to um, to provide treatment and, and sort of a, a address the challenge of, of drug addiction, perhaps in, in a way that isn't quite uh, so much focused on, on criminalization of drug use. But, but I wonder if, if you could both share any, any additional thoughts on that challenge in, in both countries, because of course, um, while we, we often think more about the US being where, where there are drug abuse, there are in fact uh, drug abuse and addiction challenges in, in Mexico as well. So maybe I'll, I'll start with you if that's okay, Gina, and then, and then we'll uh, invite Ambassador Robinson to follow. 
Sure. Um, CONADIC has been a very important agency in addressing how to prevent substance abuse and furthering treatment. The big change was, of course, that uh, drugs, demand for drugs is no longer seen as a security problem, but as a health issue. And this shift in narrative and this shift in approach of how to address it has coincided with the Biden administration as well, which is why this bicentennial framework has a very strong, solid um, guidelines of how to address this problem. And, and as was mentioned uh, previously, we do see a tendency towards synthetic opioids, and we have been sharing information in understanding how is it that they're mixing fentanyl with other drugs as methamphetamines and heroin to actually increase the potency and the addiction and expand the markets. So by understanding the health perspective and how to avoid uh, substance abuse, we can tackle it at a different level and see why patients um, become this addicted and what we can do to help revert it. Ambassador Robinson. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. As I mentioned at the top, uh, it's something that I have uh, had to address uh, up on the hill uh, a number of times. I think it's really, really significant that the that the Biden Harris administration has uh, had has made uh, this a drug policy priority um, and uh, has made it made it their mission to promote uh, evidence based treatment um, and prevention uh, and and looking at um, those communities. Uh, in the United States, that are that are most effective, uh, most affected by um, by uh, by consumption, um, uh, and looking at issues like uh, racial equity uh, and community-based uh, crime prevention, uh, and drilling down a little bit on um, perhaps those uh, those communities that have been. Uh, uh, looked at uh, from a criminal uh, corrections aspect uh, and, and looking a little bit deeper and, and trying to get at why, why, these, uh, why this envi environment exists. Um, I think it's really important and, and frankly, I applaud it. Great, thank you. Um, and we have, have one last question that came in, but I, that I, I frankly uh, I appreciate the question. It's, it, it may be a great way to conclude this panel. It's a, a little bit um, uh, perhaps provocative is the way to describe it, uh, but the, the person posing the question notes that there are high death tolls on both sides of the border in the U.S. from drug overdose and in Mexico from violence. Um, and that, that much, many of the efforts over the past decades haven't been ultimately as successful as we hoped. So the, the question asks if the governments have considered uh, reframing the issue either uh, through legalization of drugs or by treating the transnational crime organizations as terrorists or insurgent groups and responding more forcefully. So I, I suppose the question is, have you thought about either um, going to one extreme or the other instead of following what, what we might call the middle strategy, uh, which has not certainly not been as effective as, as we would hope. So I'll, I'll let you start, Ambassador Robinson. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. It is a provocative question. Um, I will say, you know, it, it, um, you know as, a, as a career diplomat, I think we're always going to try to go down uh, the middle. Um, I think it's important that we uh, do a better job of taking in, taking into account the um, the societies on both sides of the border, uh, where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are, and um, and trying to come up um, to try try to uh, create a situation where there are responsibilities on both sides that we have to deal with. And in order to do that, um, it's uh, it's very difficult to to sort of go to the go to the extremes. Although I, I will say, you know, I think at, certainly in the United States, uh, the issue of legalization 
um, is an ongoing uh, uh, discussion. Um, uh, the terror, the, uh, the, the idea of uh, naming traffickers or putting traffickers under the rubric of terrorism, I think is, a, is um, among other things, a legal question. Um, but, the, but the other issue of uh, uh, legalization uh, continues to be a hot topic in the United States and one that I think will, uh, uh, that people will continue to discuss. Thank you, um, and, and I'll turn it over to you, Gina. I'll just mention certainly uh, legalization of cannabis is is a top, perhaps a, a topic for another event, given that that uh, Mexican Supreme Court decisions and the legalization across a number of U.S. states. But but Gina, I'll turn to you for the the last comment on that question of of sort of the the one extreme or the other uh, strategy concept. I want to follow up on uh, Ambassador. Robinson, what he mentioned as, as diplomats, we first have to acknowledge that we have to understand the problem on both sides. Uh, we have to see what cooperation can be done under mutual understanding and respect, and we have to build trust among each other to be able to understand the entire panorama of a particular situation. And going to one extreme or the other would actually deviate our efforts and our ongoing current efforts of how to solve this problem. So as diplomats and as uh, experts in this, uh, in, in this kind of criminal activity, we must focus on tracing and on identifying patterns to disrupt it instead of going to the overall panorama of what could be a, an ongoing national debate. Great. Thank you, and I, I want to thank both uh, Gina Burkett and, and Ambassador uh, Todd Robinson for joining us this afternoon for kicking off our uh, 10th annual security conference uh, with presentations from the perspective of, of our two governments. We really appreciate you being with us and, and look forward to having you join us again. Perhaps uh, a year from now, we'll get an update on, on where, things, where things stand then. Um, we're going to now uh, shift gears to our next panel, so there'll be a, just a, a momentary uh, break, uh, but I want to thank everybody for joining us, and please, please stay tuned for our next panel. Again, Assistant Secretary Robinson and, and uh, Councillor Burkett, thanks so much for being with us. Okay, and now I, I have the distinct pleasure as the um, panelist for our next panel uh, on Mexico, the Mexican military's expanding role. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, our, the moderator for our next panel, uh, and that's Ambassador Tony Wayne, uh, who is known of, uh, I suspect, to many of you. Uh, Ambassador Wayne served in a variety of positions during his uh, career in the Foreign Service, including as U.S. Ambassador to Mexico and Argentina, Deputy Ambassador in Afghanistan, Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs, and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. He left the State Department in late 2015 as a career ambassador, the most senior U.S. diplomatic rank. Currently, Ambassador Wayne is engaged in a variety of activities. Uh, here at the Wilson Center, he's a public policy fellow. He leads our USMCA working group, and he also co-chairs the Mexico Institute's advisory board. He's a non-resident advisor fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Atlantic Council. He is treasurer of the American Foreign Service Association and treasurer of its PAC. Um, there are many other things that Ambassador Wayne is engaged in here at the Wilson Center and elsewhere. Um, he has an MPA from the JFK School of Government at Harvard, an MA from Princeton, an MA from Stanford, and a BA from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and with that, it is my pleasure to turn the podium, uh, so to speak, over to Ambassador Wayne, who will introduce and moderate the next panel. Thanks very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Clearly, like others who are going to join today, we had a hard time getting out of school. <laughs> but we did all get other jobs. <laughs> Although some of us are still teaching, we're back to teaching again. Anyway, thanks for that great first panel. And now we're looking forward to having a, a really interesting discussion of the public security role 
of Mexico's military services. And we're going to um, hear the presentation of two really outstanding papers, uh, one by Inigo Guevara and the other by Craig Deere, and then commentary from two uh, very expert uh, commentators, uh, uh, Cecilia Farfan Mendez and Selena Re Relu Relu Reluyo, uh, who I had the problem of, of, of had the problem. No, I had the great pleasure of working with Selena uh, when we were at the State Department together, and she was working on counterterrorism before she became a deeper expert on not only that, but also on fighting organized criminal groups. But let me, let me give a brief introduction uh, to, uh, to everybody who's here today. Craig Deere uh, has been at the National Defense University for uh, over 20 years now, and uh, has, uh, I know, written an outstanding book on the history of military, rela uh, military relations between Mexico and the United States and many other uh, very impressive works. He had 20 years working in the U.S. Army uh, before he joined NDU, um, which included service in Mexico City and service as the uh, um, in, as the office director in the Secretary the Office of Secretary of Defense, responsible for defense cooperation with Mexico. And uh, he has his uh, BA from the University of Arizona, an MA from uh, Johns Hopkins SAIS, and a PhD also from SAIS Hopkins, um, as well as a whole series of uh, opportunities within during his government service for additional training. Um, and uh, then Inigo Guevara is going to also share uh, his paper He's Director of Strategic Services at Jane's Aerospace Defense and Security. He's also a non-resident senior fellow in the Transatlantic Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center. Um, he's an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. He's a, a, a subject matter expert on Latin America and armed, the armed forces and, and especially Mexico's military. And so we're going to really profit from that today. He has his MA from Georgetown. Uh, he's graduated from a special program at NDU, and he has his BA from uh, the Tech de Monterrey. Um, Selena Realujo, Real Real <laughs> I could also say, Selena uh, is a professor of practice at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies at the National Defense University also. And she teaches a range of courses there on national security, illicit networks, transnational organized crime, counterterrorism, threat finance, and women in peace and security issues. Uh, as I mentioned, she is a former US diplomat. She also worked in the private sector uh, for a while. Uh, and she has um, taught at a number of uh, in educational institutions around the, the Washington DC area, number of universities. Um, she has uh, two decades of experience working on, on these issues in the public, private and academic circles. She has a, an MBA from Harvard Business School, um, also a, uh, uh, is a graduate of SAIS, um, of Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, and she has a certificate from Sciences Po in, uh, in France, in Paris, France. So uh, I've had the pleasure of, uh, of working with her, as I said, for a number of years. And Cecilia Farfan Mendez is, uh, leads the security research portfolio at the University of California, San Diego Center for US Mexican Studies. She's also affiliated researcher with the Center for Studies on Security, Intelligence, and Governance at ETOM in, in Mexico. And um, she has, uh, I, I know I've had the great pleasure of working with her on a plan to look at US-Mexico security cooperation over a five-year period. And this is a project that, that's still going on. And she has uh, initiated a number of other projects that we can hear about going forward and has written a number of excellent articles and regularly contributes 
to Mexico Today, uh, in, uh, in, which is published in Mexico City. So we're going to have, I think, a, a really super conversation here. First, um, hearing a little bit from each of the authors about their papers on the important role of the Mexican military is playing today, but also some background because it's played the, this role, of course, for a long time. And it's a different role than uh, we're used to in the United States for the military plane. It, it has some expanded responsibilities. So we're going to hear, we're going to hear about that. And then we'll hear some, uh, some excellent commentary from uh, Selena and Cecilia. So if I could start off inviting Inigo, if you could present uh, some of the thoughts from your paper, please. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Really like to thank Andrew Rodman and his team uh, for the invitation and frankly for their commitment to continue the legacy of the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute as the institution that is looking at U.S.-Mexico affairs here in Washington, D.C. Obviously, want to recognize my colleagues, um, Craig, Selena, Cecilia, and Ambassador Tony Wayne. Great to see you again. And I want to say, frankly, unfortunately, let me start sharing my screen here. Uh, okay, there we go. So unfortunately, we've seen um, security over the past decade or so take on a central role as the driver of the uh, U.S.-Mexico relationship. And I say that, unfortunately, because I think we all really yearn the time when it's really the economic ties, trade, food, and culture that should be driving this, this, this relationship instead of security, or may I say insecurity. But here we are. Uh, so I'm going to pretty much try to describe over the next 12 minutes or so uh, what the, uh, my upcoming paper uh, focuses on. Uh, and for that, I'm going to start pretty much on the past 15 years um, to describe the way that the Mexican military has evolved in terms of its roles and missions, as well as its relationship with the U.S. as well. And then just focus uh, last five minutes or so just on what the current AMLO administration is doing to understand why it's different and why it matters. Um, so in that sense, I do want to point out that the overall theme of the U.S.-Mexico military cooperation continues, despite Trump, despite AMLO, despite ups and downs in the relationship. That really trust uh, has, has, has really been built up over the past 15 years. And that's primarily due to the men and women of both uh, armed services. So looking back um, at the Calderon administration, and here on the, the left-hand side, I've put together a brief chart just to synthesize the focus that each of the administration put uh, the military's uh, attention towards. Uh, so with, with President Calderon, really 2006 to 2012, the focus was definitely internal security. Uh, and by that, you know, we saw uh, the Mexican military, which had traditionally been uh, employed in counterinsurgency, as well as counter narcotic operations in rural Mexico, now show up in urban areas and setting up roadblocks and, 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 and leading raids in, in, in luxurious residential areas uh, throughout the country. So that change in really the footprint of the Mexican military was what really put it under the limelight of attention of uh, not just Mexican media, but international uh, media as well. So during that time, really, the, the, the Mexican Navy um, created a new arm or re-establish re its arm of, the, of developing its, its marine infantry force, but really with a light infantry focus on making it more of a counter cartel type of uh, Marines. And at the same time, they expanded uh, their coverage uh, to provide maritime law enforcement throughout most of Mexico's coasts uh, via a network of search and rescue stations uh, throughout uh, Mexico's 11,000 kilometer coastline. So with that, we can see also the, the, 
the uh, transfer of technology or the acquisition of technologies uh, for the Navy. At this point, we had the Merida Initiative pretty much in, in, in full flex, and the U.S. supported uh, Mexican efforts at this time to uh, procure some of its equipment. Um, I'd say in, in some cases it was uh, quite significant, but relatively token type of, 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 of support. Uh, and Mexico did also shore up uh, the lion's share of most of the investments in, in, in this time. So uh, at this point, it was all about awareness and all about trying to identify uh, where the gaps were within Mexico's um, maritime as well as airspace surveillance. So uh, you can imagine really the, the, the efforts that the Mexican military took to really overhaul its air, airspace surveillance capabilities, ground-based as well as a network of aircraft uh, that could intercept incoming uh, flights, mostly coming in from the Southeast. So um, pretty much time ran out at that point for the, for the, for the Calderon administration, and then it passed on the, the, the continuation effort over to the Peña Nieto administration, who really took an, a, a different approach uh, in the sense of initially um, campaigning on the need to have a civilian-led gendarmerie force um, that could take over pretty much from the military within the next three to maybe all, all, all the way into the next six, six years. But once in power, uh, the, the, the Peña Nieto administration figured that, no, actually, the military had to continue to take on a role. Uh, so really, during his sexenio, during his administration, the military's uh, internal security role uh, increased. At the same time, um, Peña Nieto saw that uh, he wanted to take on more of a, an international approach uh, for the Mexican military. So this was really the, the, the period of opening up uh, to, to the rest of the world. Uh, and and that, that brought uh, significant challenges for the, for the Mexican military. The Mexican army uh, really focused on um, revamping or overhauling most of its land vehicle fleet. That in itself becomes a, a, a significant mission, a significant effort, because it's not just about buying equipment and Humvees and, and, and land vehicles, but it had a, deal, a great deal to, to securing um, just the, 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 the local infrastructure to produce some of those there. And at the same time, looking at the challenge of setting up new peacekeeping uh, forces that could eventually be deployed internationally as part of now Mexico's outlook um, towards a, a new type of foreign policy in which Mexico becomes a participant uh, rather than simply an observer. So interesting times really in terms of the forcing a change in the mindset of the Mexican military, while at the same style, time still requiring it to fulfill a uh, leading internal security role, uh, which the Mexican uh, army continued under the development of its um, military police forces. All of this, while at the same time trying to balance a uh, gender balanced force uh, and looking at different um, upcoming requirements as obviously the investment in the Southeast um, air surveillance network now needed to be complemented with a northern looking one uh, because we saw that they, they identified that the number of uh, flights or illegal flights uh, also migrated, uh, not just uh, towards um, the southeast of Mexico, but they migrated towards uh, the north of Mexico. So the need to, to have this capability continues while the requirement for such a network was laid out by the previous administration um, 2015 hit uh, Mexico's economy, and then along with it, um, the, the, the financial power to, to, to fund these developments. An overcrowding of roles, of missions, uh, the need to completely overhaul the Mexican Air Force and get a new generation of aircraft um, to, to, to continue to modernize its squadrons, 
uh, also becomes a, 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 a drain uh, on, on resources. And uh, at the same time, the Mexican Navy is now put in charge of Mexico's ports. This sounds like something that a Navy should already be doing, uh, but it, it, it has been quite demanding uh, for the Navy to establish a completely new um, department or, or, or directorate, a new force that can man 119 ports uh, where it needs to become a, pretty much an, an authority. You think of it at the same time as the Navy is trying to follow a directive to go back to the sea, to go back to train as a naval force, to go back to build its ships uh, and pretty much reinvigorate naval construction in Mexico's uh, ports, which I may add, uh, most of the uh, Navy run shipyards are in some of Mexico's poorest states. So they become a source of uh, job creation and uh, potential uh, for uh, technology transfers and a, and a, and a, and a complete uh, impact into the local economy. But the Mexican Navy is able to, to do that. Uh, they put out uh, their flagship, which is this, this, this new multi-purpose frigate, pretty much designed to work alongside the US Navy and uh, with a pretty large and ambitious uh, plan to put up to eight of these in, into the sea, now pretty much cut and or, or suspended where with most of the resources going to different uh, projects. So new technology developments we see around this time with, with the, the Mexican military really adopting unmanned, unmanned um, technology. And that really helps channel it down as well as creating a link to local industry. So we've seen during these past 10 years, Mexico's aerospace industries really flourish to become probably the 10th largest aerospace um, supply in the world, while not a single aircraft really takes off from Mexico. So Mexico becomes more of a tier two and tier three supply, which means a large amount of jobs are now, are now high paying jobs are now um, well equipped within Mexico. So pretty much playing with the big boys and having uh, large aspirations take on uh, new dimensions when Mexico also figures out that they need a cyber security, cyber defense uh, systems network, as well as space-based capabilities to enable them to continue to be a modernizing force. And all the time, really uh, expanding cooperation with uh, the US Armed Forces. I love this image. It really shows two neighbors, two partners, really watching each other's back and working together uh, to secure each other. Um, so throughout this, this, th th that decade, this continues. As we get into the AMLO uh, administration, the current administration, where really the focus has um, chimed away from the national defense focus that the, the armed forces had briefly over the past administration. And it's really looking at um, focusing on two uh, aspects. One, the internal security aspect, which is not unknown to the, to the armed forces. But the second one, which is relatively new, and the focus of this paper is really looking at the military as an actor in the um, administration's economic development plans. Um, and here, I'll, I'll just take a moment to, to highlight the, the, the fact that the, the, the army was pretty much tasked with taking over for the federal police and with that recreating or reestablishing the National Guard, which existed in Mexico only on paper, uh, but did exist since the 19th century. And that has now been stood up. And the initial uh, part, of course, up to about 60 or 70% of that 100,000 um, men and women force comes from the military uh, because it was the only way to stand it up um, as fast as it, it, it needed to be stood up. Um, at the same time, absorbing the, the, the federal police and putting them into a new type of uh, roles and missions, which the military had uh, gone into only superficially, but at this point, 
during the first year of the, the, the AMLO administration, the military is tasked with fighting the huachicoleros, so the fuel smugglers, small fuel smuggling gangs throughout Mexico, and of manning as well uh, logistics and hiring literally thousands of drivers that could take over the transportation of fuel um, away from the pipelines so that these could be shut down and secured eventually. Um, interesting to note, the, the, the Mexican military set up a, an 800 uh, troop force in the north of Mexico to fight uh, illegal fuel smuggling coming in from the states, from the US into Mexico. And they've managed to secure somewhere in the region of uh, 60 million, uh, around 20 million liters, which is equivalent to around 60 million US uh, dollars over the past year or so. Um, another one of the roles which, which was new to the military uh, under the, the AMLO administration, as well as the, not just the, the National Guard, but the Army, was to be deployed as a uh, border uh, police, as a border force. Uh, and that uh, was pretty much um, something that, that took place after Trump um, threatened to put in a 5% tax on all Mexican goods if uh, the Mexican um, government didn't cooperate in, 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 those, in, in that mission. Uh, we need to uh, say it as it is, and that's pretty much reflected in, in, in that paper. Along the same, um, the Navy is tasked at this point with uh, cleaning up beaches. Uh, so again, a new role for them to supporting the environmental forces and uh, the military is um, tasked with transforming their largest air base into a, a new international airport, the Felipe Angeles International Airport. Um, so while this is uh, happening, of course, COVID hits, changes our world, uh, changes the plan, and obviously threatens uh, the rest of the AMLO administration's large infrastructure projects. So we see a natural uh, progression of then using the military for a broad number of national development uh, projects, in this case, uh, to finish off the, the, the construction of the transformation of Santa Lucia into that new um, airport, and then uh, tasking the military with taking control uh, for not just the implementation of the, or the construction of these large infrastructure uh, projects, which now include also the, the Maya Railway, a tourist development uh, program in, in the Yucatan Peninsula, and taking control of some small airports uh, in the region as well. And then um, pretty much ordering Sedena to, or, or the, the Mexican military to create a state um, owned a company that will not just uh, construct these projects, but manage them uh, over the long term. So with that, and we're coming up on the another presentation, we've got uh, additional uh, requirements for the military to distribute textbooks uh, in some of the uh, most difficult states of Mexico, some of the most violent um, states of Mexico, and an additional mission for the Army's Corps of Engineers to build a network of almost 3,000 um, of these national bienestar or welfare uh, banks, which are a uh, government-backed uh, bank designed to provide um, some of Mexico's poorest areas with a banking system. Um, and they've, 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 they've started construction of these. They've delivered over uh, half of them at this point. So with that, uh, we see also, frankly, the relationship between um, the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, there was a little bit of a hiccup there uh, with the arrest of General Cienfuegos. But of course, I'll let my um, colleague uh, Craig talk a lot more about that. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, what we've seen is continued uh, relationship, continued trust between both forces. And uh, at the end of the day, we can see that there, there continues to be broad public support um, for the uh, um, Mexican security forces 
So this is a highly respected um, INEGI um, survey um, conducted uh, where we can see here that from 2020, 21, um, the Army and the Navy continue to be highly praised uh, and considered as uh, one of the most trusted institutions in, in Mexico. The question here is, do you trust this institution? And as we can see here, the shift from the Federal Police to the National Guard uh, seems to have worked. Uh, most of the perceptions that I've heard are that uh, when, when people talk about the, the, the new National Guard, they, they make the distinction between the former Federal Police and the uh, Army-run National Guard. Uh, with, with a lot of the trust going to the Army uh, run National Guard. And at the end of the day, we see that overall um, Mexico's security institutions seem to, to, to be on the uptick in terms of public perception. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Inigo. We can. And now I'd, I'd like to ask. Um, Cecilia to offer some some thoughts. I, I neglected to mention that Cecilia brings to her role at UC San Diego a, a doctorate from uh, UC San, from Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, and a master's degree from Columbia University. And she did her undergraduate work at ETOM that we mentioned before in Mexico City. So Cecilia, please. Thank you, Ambassador Wayne, for such a generous introduction. And of course, uh, thank you to the Mexico Institute and to the Wilson Center for hosting me and having me. Um, I had the pleasure of reading Inigo's paper. And before I go into my remarks, I just want to say that anyone who's interested in what's happening with the armed forces in Mexico, this is a paper that is a must read for you. And I certainly hope that this is also a paper that becomes available uh, in Spanish. I'm going to wink at the Mexico Institute and say, hopefully they can make that happen. But certainly, I think there would be great benefit of this publication existing, uh, both in English uh, and Spanish. So I'm going to uh, remark on three particular points that I think are, uh, are very relevant to our discussion today and that Inigo uh, brings forward in his uh, research. The first point that I want to discuss is how Inigo makes a very convincing argument about the agency that the Mexican armed forces have. And with this, I mean that oftentimes when we discuss the militarization of public safety in Mexico, the discussion tends to sound that this is something that is being decided in the executive branch and then that the armed forces are sort of falling into line with whatever is being discussed by the executive. This, of course, was called into question uh, somewhat when General Cienfuegos was arrested in Los Angeles and then he was returned to Mexico. And so then at that point, there were some discussions around the leverage that Sedena in particular had uh, in relation to the Lopez Obrador administration. But what this, uh, what Inigo's research shows is that there is very much agency, as I mentioned, from the armed forces. Uh, and this is to say that they are very much involved in what is happening uh, to them and how uh, they are being directed. My favorite example from the paper is um, I one mentioned their um, uh, lobbying uh, for procuring certain equipment that is going to be used for maritime patrolling and gathering intelligence. And what the Mexican Navy does is that instead of saying that this is going to be equipment for intelligence gathering and patrolling uh, uh, maritime areas, they say these are assets for uh, of rescue operations. And I think this example is very telling because it shows precisely that they're very aware of this public perception of perhaps an expansive role of the armed forces and that they definitely want to craft a message uh, that is one that puts them not into the intelligence gathering, but these rescue uh, operations. So again, just to reiterate, I think uh, this point of agency that the armed forces, again, are very much involved in these discussions with different administrations of what is it what they want uh, is something that we need to bring into the conversations when we talk about this militarization of public safety. Uh, in Mexico. The second point, and I think this is one perhaps of the most thought provoking elements of this research is that Inigo really challenges this idea that there is a continuation from previous exenios into the Lopez Obrador administration. And this has come at a cost uh, you know, for both the army and the navy. 
And with this, I mean, uh, essentially what Inigo was mentioning at the beginning of his presentation is during the Calderon and Peña Nieto administrations, both the army and the Navy uh, made an, or emphasized this need to modernize, uh, to be, to also acquire better capabilities. And with the Lopez Obrador administration, while it has definitely expanded the remit of the army and the Navy, it really cut short the, this aspiration of being able to modernize uh, the forces as they wanted um, to do so. And so what is interesting here, and Inigo went into some of these examples, so let me highlight them again. So we of course have the expanded law enforcement role, especially through the National Guard, which again on paper civilian, but again, Inigo shows, and I think several of us have discussed is not truly a civilian institution, but also migration border control, ports and customs, building airports and railways, uh, building welfare banks, also removing seaweed uh, from the Mexican Caribbean, and also being involved in revenue generating uh, operations. So it's not only that they're being tasked with additional things that we didn't see in previous administrations, but they're also now in the position where they, they can generate that revenue. And what is interesting here is that it really introduces some much needed nuance into this discussion of how the armed forces relate to the Lopez Obrador administration. To the extent that they are included in this economic agenda or this very ambitious economic plan, they've had also had to renegotiate uh, that relationship. And I think that also raises questions about how the US is going to relate to the Mexican armed forces as these roles are expanding. So Inigo mentions, and I agree that there's this cooperation uh, that continues despite some very negative narratives that have happened around US-Mexico security cooperation. But as you know, these armed forces are being tasked with other uh, duties, it will be interesting to see uh, precisely how, um, how the US can engage with its partners in Mexico. The final point, um, I want to highlight is the issue of trust. And this is great because Inigo ended on that. And I will also uh, finish my remarks on that point. And I think it's very interesting to see precisely since we've had information from the victimization survey that's conducted by INEGI, as Inigo also mentioned, that both the Army and the Navy are the two institutions that have um, very high levels of trust uh, from the population. Now, allow me to introduce also some new ones on my own. And Inigo, we're very happy to share these data for you as you continue uh, this research, because it seems to be more complex as we see these expanded roles of the armed forces um, in Mexico. So at the Center for US-Mexican Studies in partnership with UNAM, we conducted a survey on perceptions of democracy, and we had a whole section of the armed forces. And what we did that was different from other service on democracy is that we, uh, similar to Brightline Watch, which happens in the US, we ask citizens, but we also had a group of what we call experts, which included academics, policy experts, and journalists. And what's very interesting here is that between the survey of the general population and those who we call experts, there's a very clear divide of whether or not uh, the armed forces should be conducting these tasks. And this is, of course, a debate that we have seen play out in the public arena where we see you know, human rights organizations, scholars like myself, really question whether or not you know, the Navy should be cleaning seaweed, uh, for example, from the Korean or building welfare banks. Uh, interestingly, for the general population, what we find is that they have very high levels of trust for this expanded role, which again, I think should make us think how does, this, how does this translate uh, into the armed forces as political actors as we continue to study these? And so let me give you just some examples. So we asked them if they trusted, for example, the armed forces to be in charge of vaccines uh, during the pandemic, so COVID vaccines. And 77% said that they had, you know, they trusted the armed forces to do that. Um, similarly, 72% um, trusted or trust the armed forces to distribute uh, the benefits of social programs. This is a little bit lower for the fight against organized crime and a little bit lower for building an airport. Now, what's interesting, 52%, by the way, uh, I should mention that, uh, 56. What's interesting about this data is that for a long time, we've thought or at least hypothesized that this may have to do with perhaps low levels of corruption within these institutions, that perhaps because those scandals, you know, of course, Cienfuegos aside, don't really reach uh, these institutions as often. That may have 
to do with it. But what we found is that actually 52% of the people, so all of those who agree that, you know, the armed forces vaccinating, building an airport, but they, you know, them, they 52% still think that the armed forces cut deals with organized crime. So this is interesting because it really adds this complexity that is not necessarily because they have a pristine image in relation to the public, they may seem other, there's other mechanisms uh, at play there. And of course, you know, of those who answer that they believe if the armed forces cut deals with organized crime, of those who responded, yes, 88% think these are threats to democracy. So again, this is interesting just because it adds complexity to an already very nuanced paper that you um, have brought to us. So I'll finish my remarks there and I'll just once again, invite everyone to read this paper once it becomes uh, published. And again, really uh, encourage Inigo to have it available both in English and Spanish, because I think your work really adds a much needed nuance to a discussion um, around the armed forces in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Those are the kindest words I've heard. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> And thanks for add, adding that nuance from your own research that you did with UNAM on uh, public opinion. I think that that's very important. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite uh, Craig Deer to uh, join and share uh, his excellent paper, a synopsis of, of his paper, where he took some of the same issues and looked at them in a, in a, in a different and very revealing perspective. Craig, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'd really much prefer not to even have to talk about my paper and just go into a conversation about Inigo's. It's interesting how we covered, in, in essence, the same subject, but from, from different perspectives and with different uh, levels of analysis. It was interesting, I, I listened to, uh, to Inigo's and, uh, and I didn't hear uh, the term militarization mentioned once. And it was interesting that uh, you didn't mention it, but uh, Cecilia did use the word corruption once. So again, fascinating how, how these things are viewed. What I attempted to do in the paper was make the broad point that Mexico, uh, that when we talk about militarization in Mexico, it is not a new theme. Right, Mexico has been in some form or fashion militarized since the outset. Got this really cool picture of a bunch of Aztec warriors at Hernan Cortes and some conquistadores coming in and saying, you know, when the Spanish arrived, it's not that they imposed uh, some form of military militarism on a on a peace loving society. They fell in on a already hierarchical, authoritarian, rather militaristic uh, society of their own in the Aztecs and other, and other indigenous groups. We have, you know, fast forward 300 years with the uh, heavy hand of the crown. And when we have an independence movement, uh, that's obviously uh, a large role for the military. In the first 20 or 30 years of a Mexican Republic, uh, you have key figures such as Nicolás Bravo and uh, and Guerrero and Iturbide, and of course Santa Ana, who's president, uh, no less, uh, no fewer than 18 times. We go, uh, we fast forward to the to the the scar that uh, continues to certainly haunt the Mexican psyche, less so in the U.S. of the 46, 48 Mexican-American War. The rest of the century is a struggle between the liberals, embodied by uh, Benito Juarez and the conservatives embodied by Porfirio Diaz. And we know how that ends, that leads into the Mexican Revolution, which uh, was uh, horrific for the Mexican society. And in fact, left uh, such a, a scar that the Mexican society was virtually, was, was willing to tolerate virtually anything other than revo resorting to levels of violence again, which begot the uh, eventually uh, the pre-evolved and, and the, the first few uh, presidents within the PRI were, of course, um, general officers from La Revolución, right? You have Alvaro Obregón, you've got Calles, you've got uh, Lázaro Cárdenas, you've got Avila Camacho, 
And it isn't until 46 that the first chemically pure civilian president comes along, Miguel Aliman, and that was done in a degree of cooperation with, um, with the Mexican armed forces, primarily the army to say, okay, we're going to turn this over to you, but we continue to, to play a role behind the scenes. And that, that both explicit and implicit agreement continued through the, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, all the way up with, with ups and downs, with, with degrees of, of, of unrest, student unrest in the 60s, uh, minor insurgencies in the late 60s, early 70s. But, but things were still under control with, with an armed force that was relatively uh, well cared for, but not overly large. But so this was uh, militarization a la Mexicana, if you will. That's my argument. Um, the armed forces were, were largely out of sight, um, but everyone knew that if there was a crisis, they would come back. So we roll into the 21st century with the, uh, the, the election of Vicente Fox, first time a non-pre-candidate won in 71 years. And Fox, of course, was the antithesis to previous presidents, um, uh, governed in a very different way, uh, chose different types of, of defense ministers and, and, and Navy secretaries. Um, and in his autobiography of about 300 and some odd pages, he doesn't mention the military once. So that was not the best uh, relationship in the world. And we go from, but, but that's when we start to see um, the dismantling uh, to a degree of the relationship between organized crime, drug trafficking organizations, and the pre with levels of corruption that, uh, that we understand. And then that, uh, that stasis was interrupted when a brand new administration comes into power with different players. And, and that's when we begin to see, we didn't know it at the time, but, but maybe a, a bit, I would show you a, an interesting slide that shows how that begins to, uh, to tick up. But it wasn't, of course, until Felipe Calderon is, is uh, elected in 2006, inaugurated in December, and then in two, immediately goes after. He'd campaigned on a platform of, of doing something about security. And he goes after the, uh, the drug trafficking organizations uh, very seriously. And that's, we're all familiar with, uh, with the results of that approach. Uh, violence really takes off. Um, and even though uh, that occurs, or as that occurs, Calderon enters into conversations with, uh, with his uh, partner in the, in the US, President George W. Bush, the Medida Initiative begins, and we, we start to see improved uh, cooperation, not just in defense, but that's perhaps where we see the greatest change, but in security issues, intelligence issues, Etc. Um, obviously, Calderon leaves. Uh, Peña Nieto comes in, promising to change that. We see a bit of a, of a decrease, uh, but he too, after a while, with the encouragement of the armed forces, uh, re-engages with the U.S. because the Mexican military had become um, not dependent, but uh, but pleased with the levels of cooperation. Uh, between them and their U.S. counterparts and the benefits uh, that, that accrued to the Mexican military in terms of improved training, um, knowledge sharing, uh, beginning of interoperability, et cetera. So all of that goes, goes on relatively well. And then we come to the arrival of President uh, Lopez Obrador, who had promised, um, of course, during his campaign to do the following things, end the war on drugs and the military's active role in it, remove the army from the streets and return them to their barracks. Uh, focus on the range of allegations regarding abuses committed by members of the armed forces, including the infamous cases of Tlatlaya and Ayutzinapa, disband the Estado Mayor Presidencial, you know, a militarized version of the US Secret Service, and name retired uh, general and flag officers to serve as the heads of Bocedena and Semar, which would have been 
revolutionary to use that term, to not choose um, among the senior active duty uh, military members to serve as the defense and Navy secretaries respectively would have been dramatic, but that's not what happened. Uh, in fact, uh, as he, between his election and inauguration, he already starts to change his tune about the, the military going back to the barracks, et cetera. Uh, we see then his big idea, great slide with, uh, with images of the Guardia Nacional. Inigo mentions this. He noted that it was not just in the 1917 constitution, but in, the, in a previous constitution of 1876, so since the 19th century, this concept had been around of a Guardia Nacional, pero de carácter civil, right? It was supposed to be civilian in nature. It was supposed to be a non-military police force, at least as written. And in fact, as Lopez Obrador um, was selling the concept to the society and to the Congress, uh, he emphasized that it would be uh, subordinate to uh, civilian control, civilian leadership. As it turns out, uh, that has not happened. And that's when guys like me started to kind of go, hmm, this is, uh, this is different. This is uh, militarization, not simply a la Mexicana, this is militarization a la AMLO. And the question is how how bad can it get? And bad in what sense? Let me, uh, let me emphasize here that I'm not suggesting for a moment that, uh, that the Mexican military is seeking greater political power. Uh, they have not sought, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they have not sought these increased roles. Indeed, if you talk to, to Mexican military officers below the secretary level, but at the general officer level, as well as uh, you know, colonels, lieutenant colonels, majors, uh, they're not super happy with with doing this. You know, had they wanted to be, you know, work for USAID equivalent, or uh, they would they wouldn't have joined the military. They joined the military to to perf to conduct military operations, not to um, to deliver repartos sociales to work on immigration issues, um, health, education. Uh, this is not what they were about. And, and yet we, we recognize, let me also add briefly, that, uh, that, that another complication here is the seven, 1917 Constitution, Article 89, I believe, which provides, which tasks the military, not simply with an external defense role, but an internal security role. So with that, that task, the, the difference between internal security and public safety, there's, there's a lot of overlap there. And so in terms of legality, um, one can make the argument that if the president gives a lawful order and uh, what, what is the military's responsibility in, in, in executing that order? Are they, they can either uh, salute smartly and, and carry it out or not do it. And that idea is, is foreign to them. Uh, one of the, uh, I co-authored co a piece with Raul Benitez last year, uh, a study on the Mexican military culture. And one of the strong characteristics of the Mexican military, especially the army, is absolute subordination and loyalty to their superiors. And in this case, uh, the sole civilian in the chain of command is the president. And so the, this idea of, of not obeying what the president tells you to do is simply inconceivable. So the issue is not one of legality. Uh, as I looked at this issue from sort of a a civil military relations lens, uh, the issue became one of really of legitimacy. And, and legitimacy both internally and externally. And, uh, and Inigo pointed out, and Cecilia in her comments mentioned this as well. And I've got uh, a similar slide to Inigo's in terms of how the public supports this, right? Uh, this is, this is 
despite the fact that AMLO had promised to return the military to the barracks, and despite the fact that he had promised that the Guardia Nacional would be of carácter civil, and he is not doing that. In fact, the proposal is to uh, take the Guardia Nacional and subordinate it entirely under uh, La Secretaría de Defensa Nacional. And so the, uh, the Secretary of Defense uh, commands the Army, the Air Force, and the Guardia Nacional. And that uh, simply is, is not in keeping with, with what was promised. And yet, and yet, um, the public, by and large, with a caveat, uh, Cecilia described, you know, those who were into it, you know, uh, people who are, who are active members and advocating the role of civil society, those who are in, within the academic spheres, et cetera, are in fact concerned with this militarization a la AMLO, you know, this even greater degree of militarization. There's a, a fascinating website that I hadn't seen until recently. Um, what's it called? Elementario Nacional de, la, de lo Militarizado. And this has clearly been going on for a while. And I, they probably take it a bit too far, but, but they make the case that 246 activities that are fundament, fundamentally of non-military origin have been delegated, delegated or tasked to the military. And again, those include migration, reparto sociales, education, health, to say nothing about seguridad pública, right? Public security. So, so those who are, who are in the environment paying attention to this are concerned, but by and large, the society is not. They continue to, to, to have uh, ratings in the, in the mid to upper 80s, which leads one to the conclusion that given the continued levels of violence and uh, issues of you know, forced disappearances, femicides, uh, feminicides, et cetera, the, the public is, there may be a textbook solution that works well in their literature, but I need to get my kids to school and I need to be able to get to work and my, my wife needs to be able to get to the, the grocery store to shop. And if it takes the military police in the streets or La Guardia Nacional to do that, then so be it. The, the tragedy, the tragedy here is that, and Inigo has written about this, he mentioned it briefly in his, in his remarks, is that now four successive presidents have made the case of needing to improve the civilian police forces at the federal, state, and municipal level, and they have all failed. And, and, uh, and it is though they have, they have given up. I mean, and if in the case of AMLO, who promised to send the military back to the barracks and who had a relatively, you know, the, the lore was, uh, the word on the street was that AMLO just really didn't get along well with the military over the years and there are reasons for that that we can get into later. And if he turns to the military and he explicitly says, I'm using the military because the federal police force is corrupt, then, uh, then what are we to do? I, I see I'm getting the hook, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, sorry, I lost some time playing around with the tech. I uh, look forward to, uh, to Q&A, thanks. Thanks very much, Craig. Well, you got all the key points out there and you, this is a number of very serious questions. Selena, you're going to, Offer some thoughts, please. Thank you. Sure, and in the interest of time, we want to leave some space, right, for Q&A from the public. So Craig um, uh, basically summarized his paper, which I think really provides an important historical context for the role of the military since the birth of the Mexican state, which is very much in contrast with neighboring countries that have seen as well the expansion of the role of their military in public security or countering transnational organized crime. And that's what we've seen. He's gone through, um, the, I guess, the dominance of the pre for six decades and that symbiotic relationship with the military um, and how that changed with the rise and arrival of Vicente Fox. But I think just to complement both of the presentations, we've seen this kind of persistent theme of the reliance on the military due to, if anything else, 
um, the absence or the inadequacy of civilian police authorities. And we've seen this throughout the time, especially also when you were in Mexico City, Ambassador Wayne, right? All the efforts um, and maybe some of the polling is actually indicating that because there's no one else to rely on and the military is much more visible because they are in the streets. So there's a bigger question. And also the way the polls are set up, depending how they're structured, you have like, it's like a multiple choice test, right? In terms of you have the, it's the police, the military, sometimes the National Guard is in there and then they have state and local. And we see that divergence, right? Of the high 80s in terms of scores to the 50s, which we've seen in multiple samplings. Um, and what is also quite disturbing, and we see this throughout the paper where Craig um, starts to explain, particularly during AMLO, the expansion. So maybe it's not the militarization of Mexico, it's the expansion, and maybe I would say the overburdening of the mission of the military as being kind of the jack of all trades and the go-to guys and gals, right, for whatever the issues are. Um, one thing that I would have liked to have seen in the paper was a little bit more on the Peña Nieto piece in terms of if we're gonna take a look at the different sexenios, the last four, and more importantly, refer to the um, establishment of the, uh, the gendarmerie, uh, which Inigo does cover um, in his paper. And then more importantly, I think the bigger question for those of us who are in the webinar today is, what implications do these analyses have going forward? And this is where I have seen, and I think you all know I've looked at the expansion of the role of the military in combating transnational organized crime. So they become a defense force to an internal security force, not just in Mexico, but throughout Latin America. And through those interviews we've seen, for example, in Central America, many military officers were concerned that you know they weren't trained to be police, they didn't sign up to be police as Craig had uh, referred in his remarks. And then more importantly, the fear that their image as one of the most prized institutions in society would be tarnished by accusations. And we have seen there are proven cases of abuse of power and human rights. Um, and that is definitely the case in Mexico. So when we take a look at all these extra tasks, and I think AMLO also is a victim of what we call campaigning is one thing, right? And then governing is a totally different reality. He cannot survive and he cannot promote his socioeconomic agenda without relying on um, the way he has perhaps modernized, but also modified, as Indigo's paper also shows, basically having the military play a role in public works, right? There have been references already um, during the webinar today towards the new airport, the train in the Yucatan, the Tren Maya. Um, and then also we didn't touch upon the use of the Navy, right, to become uh, port authorities um, and enforcing customs. So these are roles that normal civilian agencies in functioning states would be assigned and tasked and resourced. But because of the deficiencies um, and poor performance, and we have touched upon it, but we haven't really focused on it, the levels of corruption and the infiltration of different state institutions, including the police and other security, as well as the military. And I think that was quite um, telling the case of uh, Cienfuegos, right? In terms of the influence that Sedena had in making it a priority to have uh, General Cienfuegos return to Mexico. And in a quick, very expeditious review of the case that took the DEA, what, seven to 10 years to do, in seven to 10 weeks, he was uh, not pursued. And I think this is a bigger question going forward with the military so overstretched, not to mention all the COVID related missions that they have, um, when and where will the backbone break? There's gonna be a certain point where those 80, 90% approval ratings are going to start to come down, especially if we start to see just um, discontent, right? There's now even more violence uh, he had spoken in the first session today about um, violence and assassinations of journalists, political figures. The sense of insecurity is uh, prevalent at every part of society, but more importantly, everyone turns to the military because that's who's there. And despite all of the efforts uh, with US assistance to try to prop up civilian authorities, particularly in terms of policing at the federal, municipal and the state level, 
um, we've actually not seen uh, the fruits of all that uh, time and treasure, right, in terms of how much has been invested in going forward. These are two really important papers, and I think that give uh, the readers a better understanding of how powerful the military, both Samar and Sedena and now the National Guard are. But it also, they plant questions as to what is to come, and more importantly, how sustainable is it? And if uh, the Mexican government, that's also just like all the other governments in the world, really facing fiscal and economic pressures, trying to recover from COVID, can you sustain that spending and the deployment of those resources and forces um, in order to actually attack um, the insecurity and violence that is just as prevalent um, that we've seen over the last 10 years in Mexico, if not actually getting worse. So I offer those as some comments. I congratulate both Inigo and Craig on two very timely and very well-researched papers, um, but it also plants a lot of questions as to what's gonna happen um, in the near and midterm uh, future. Thanks. Thank you, Selena. Excellent. Maybe if everybody can come back on for a minute, we can talk about a couple of those questions. So first, let me ask a question. I think you, you've you all been hitting this nail on the head. Jack of all trades, right? Being asked to do something. It's like um, we've seen in other societies, including the US, military says, we can do that. And then, you know, they go and they do a credible job of doing it. And so they get more responsibilities than a number of times. Um, clearly that's appealed to AMLO who has not shown himself to be a big institution builder in other parts of the, of the government. He's relying on this institution. It, and Selena, you know, reminded us that's, that's a lot to do for a lot of people with a lot of responsibility. So let me ask two questions. Let, let's do, we'll do two first. One, on the front, there's a lot more opportunity, it seems to me, for corruption given all these tasks, um, not only organized crime, but building public works and uh, you know, doing other things. So are we seeing, do we think there is more corruption in the armed forces? And then I wanna ask, what does this, this expanded role mean for any cooperation between the US military and the Mexican military? And in a lot of ways, wouldn't it seem more that the Mexican military should now be coordinating even more with the civilian services in the United States if we're really taking on transnational organized crime, which is not a responsibility uh, primarily of the US military. But let's do the corruption first. Who would who'd like to say something just about the temptations of the corruption that are now out there? In, Inigo. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Absolutely. Putting the military next to the public works uh, money pit is necessarily one of the, the military's, should be on the, the military's threat agenda, right? The military so far has this perception in Mexico of being a not as corrupt institution of being um, an honest um, institution uh, and and particularly a super loyal institution, right? So they they they, they want to they want to continue to to have that perception, but putting them next to not just a lot of investment dollars into what what's going to be at least a, a, a 13 to 15 billion dollar project is pretty much putting you know the the adam's apple in front of them the, the the temptation right there and then um further transforming that and giving them um <clears throat> telling them that their pensions are going to be funded by the operation of this new state level entity uh, is 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 also very very macabre, if I would if I would call it that. It's it's I I I, I think if someone hasn't thought it through, uh, there 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 could be an intention here to just tempt the armed forces in a very macabre way. Right. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you. I mean, yes, just to add to what Inigo was saying, I think 
adding to not only that you have all these duties now that you're responsible for, but also that you are basically hiding all the documents related to the transactions under the guise of national security. So it, these two institutions have been notorious for how um, not transparent they are, how opaque they are in terms of providing information. I think, you know, speaking of violence against journalists in Mexico, um, some journalists in Mexico have been very good at showing that putting these um, type of functions for the armed forces can produce these very negative uh, outcomes and very high levels of corruption that are increasingly harder uh, to really scrutinize compared to civilian institutions. So I think added not only to the temptation, but also just how opaque these institutions have traditionally been, it's even, you know, a worse outcome that we would like. And we've already seen some of these functions like collecting customs and other things are very big temptations and in many countries, they are a source of, of corruption. So we have that challenge. So how about a little bit the military to military cooperation? Period of time that I was in Mexico working, we really, that, that was a big focus. And we really saw a great improvement in military to military cooperation between NORTHCOM and, and the leadership of, of Sedena and Samar. Um, but now there, I mean, there's a, there was already not quite an overlap, a perfect overlap of function, but now it seems to be becoming greater. So what do you do? How, do, how should the U.S. be treating the Mexican armed forces? Not that, I mean, in, how should we think through what does cooperation mean right now? And what's the best kind of cooperation we can have? Selena. Well, in terms of like what I call non-controversial and non-security related, we've actually seen a lot of collaboration with U.S. Northern Command and U.S. Army North, particularly on the COVID front, right? Because it's not controversial. Everyone, it's the common enemy and there are very direct ways that we can help operationally and tactically, right? Setting up the mobile um, hospitals, how to understand distribution networks that the military does quite well. And that's been pretty well received. And a lot of the exercises we've historically done on humanitarian assistance and disaster response. Um, we can actually see these public works thing kind of as an offshoot of those types of recovery uh, missions uh, in the past. As you know, we didn't really talk about today, but the new National Security Act of 2020 in Mexico um, really starts to uh, put handcuffs on a lot of uh, the agents and the people who have been trying to combat corruption and crime and human and drug trafficking. Um, so it's been a little tense in terms of uh, trying to conduct actual investigations and operations, um, but it's on a case by case basis. I think the um, bicentennial framework uh, that the Assistant Secretary uh, Ambassador Robinson discussed in the first part of today's uh, webinar um, have, is, have promise, right, in terms of their elements of that to actually resume those bilateral working groups that you had headed up, Ambassador Wayne, is a good step forward. Um, and also is trying to see how uh, both the human trafficking and the fentanyl trafficking are common um, enemies uh, in terms of deaths and violence on both sides of the border. So I think uh, the framework is there. The question is, how do you put it into practice? And then more importantly, you've delineated um, in the US, the military supports law enforcement actions. And that's actually kind of true as well in Mexico, as uh, Craig's paper alluded to, the armed, the armed services have the responsibility, but they don't have the authority to actually apply the law in terms of public security. So there are windows of opportunity, um, uh, but I still think it's quite an uphill battle as I've written um, fairly extensively. Uh, I'm from New York. I'm not a cynic, I'm a realist. So, uh, but these are the things that I'm worried about. And then also for those who haven't seen it, the Transparency International uh, corrupt perceptions of corruption index have uh, come out. Uh, Mexico is still quite low on the tier. And there was something that uh, Delia Ferreira, who had uh, made a speech about it, all of these COVID related um, kind of what they call recovery funds are a huge opportunity for any elements in any government um, to put their, to line their pockets. And this is particularly true of Latin America. So the question then is how do you protect the integrity of those military officers who assigned to these. I mean, it's one of these things where building a base is very different than building 
a private entity like the Tren Maya or the airport. And then all the contracts that surround the acquisition of material, cement, all of these things. And uh, the word I always remember when I was little, when I used to go to Mexico, hay que pagar la mordida, the little bribe. It was always in the diminutive, the mordida. <laughs> um, but that's, I think, the question, if you ask the military, they are very worried about tarnishing their reputation and being involved in, uh, let's say, as uh, Craig calls them, illegitimate missions. They're not illegal, they're illegitimate. Let me just ask to build on that. So the National Guard has assumed a, a much larger enforcement role, but who does investigations? Do they have their own investigation and intelligence unit? Who collects the intelligence? Who decides where the uh, cartel is most active? Is it the National Guard doing that? Is somebody else doing it? Is, is it Sedena intelligence or Samar intelligence? Is it still, we no longer have CSEN, but we have the evolution of CSEN. Um, yeah, we have CNI. CNI. And, 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 and yes, uh, Sedena's uh, section seven continues to, to, to operate. Uh, and coordinate with, with the National Guard on that. And remember, the National Guard absorbed the federal police. So, and along with that, it absorbed its, its scientific arm, it absorbed, or absorbed its aviation arm, and its intelligence uh, collection capabilities as well. So, so we should assume that the National Guard continues to conduct intel activities. We're getting close here. Craig, would you... What you want to offer some thoughts for for concluding here? Yeah, a couple of thoughts uh, to complement what uh, what everybody else has has already mentioned, which I agree with everything. I remember uh, interviewing uh, a predecessor several times removed to yours, Mr. Ambassador uh, Ambassador John Negroponte, about his time in in Mexico, and he recalled a conversation with. Uh, the Secretary of Defense at the time, uh, Antonio Riviello. And he asked him why the military wasn't more involved in doing counter drug operations other than cutting down pop, you know, open poppy and marijuana. And he said the big reason was he didn't want to expose them to more opportunities for corruption. And so this ties back to these illegitimate missions, uh, to use that term, uh, or, or missions of, of of questionable legitimacy uh, that just expose them to a wide range of corruption opportunity. And one of the, the stories uh, that, that, that used to run around back in my day in Mexico City was it, what, it wasn't that senior officers were involved in, in corruption regarding drugs, other things, but it was in fact with, with building uh, installations, contracting, et cetera. And as everybody has, has pointed out, when you put them in charge of, of this, of what did you go say, $15 billion worth of contracts, and as Cecilia said, that are largely uh, not reported because of national security reasons, it cannot help but increase the opportunity for corruption. And that simply isn't helpful. A final comment on uh, on cooperation. We 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 know that uh, over the years the, the U.S. military and the Mexican military uh, grew up differently, and they have different roles and responsibilities. The, the easiest example is in the U.S. The ATF has responsibilities for for firearms. In in Mexico, it's the military. Well, so how does the Mexican military engage with the U.S. agency? And and now we we've, we've expanded that multiple fold with all these increased roles. And I would suspect it's going to make uh, coordination and cooperation uh, more and more difficult. Putting aside the Cien Fuegos case, putting aside other things, it's, uh, it's just, it's gonna be harder. So it's gonna require uh, a lot of dedicated effort to, to keep things on track. Thanks. Well, thank you all very much. Selena, Inigo, Cecilia, Craig, thanks very much for your insights. Uh, we've, I've certainly profited a lot from it. And I want to invite the audience to come back next week 
we're going to get together again on February 1st, and we're going to talk about femicides and crime prevention in Mexico, subfederal actors in bilateral security cooperation, and an assessment of AMLO's security strategy. So it's going to be a very interesting second session. You can find the details and sign up on the website of the Mexico Institute. And thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you again. Thanks again to all of our speakers.